All right, so today is, is a bit of a, I hope it'll be a fun lecture, a bit of a discussion on, on aging. So um, those of you who don't know this comic, it's uh, from Pot Higher and Deeper. Um, this is actually very accurate. If you're ever in grad school, this is perception of the grad student age. Very, very accurate, actually. So, you know, I'm much older than 27, so I am a old fart in lab years. It's very true. And this is like the, kind of like I think the dirtiest, the dirtiest little secret of lab research that the majority of all the like major scientific advances that people that, that you see are actually like hands on done by people in their 20s and 30s. Like just the honest truth. Like um, once you get to like your 40s and 50s, you're running a lab like this, you're managing people like this, you're maybe you know, helping them think up the ideas, but they're the hands that do it. Right, and I'm basically about three years removed from that myself. So it's 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 something that's an actual reality. It's a dirty little secret that I don't think you are, are uh, aware of it unless you work in a lab yourself. Right, it's fun, but it's definitely something to think about. All right, so today um, this is kind of what we're going to talk about. We're going to first talk about the demographics of aging and why aging is a is going to be something that you as bioengineers will encounter as a condition that you'll have to think about going forward. All right, well, I'll talk about kind of the molecular um, interactions that go into aging in humans, what happens in humans. And a lot of that is stuff that we kind of learned from model organism studies. So we're going to uh, talk about some data from there. So kind of how, kind of a little bit of the past history of like how data from model organism studies inform what we know about aging in humans. All right? And then we'll talk about some possible ways to stay healthy as you age. Uh, two biggest things are kind of drugs that you can take to actually uh, be healthy as you grow older, and uh, caloric, caloric restriction, which is something that's actually very uh, proven in animal models, but it's been very controversial when you uh, get to humans. All right. So, first off, to start, well, there we're at an interesting point in in um, human history. Um, I don't think this has ever happened, where there are probably as many people over 65 as there are younger than five years old. That has probably never happened in, in, in human history. I, I mean, I don't know ever since they start, but basically ever since they started recording population statistics. Like, that doesn't happen. There aren't that many older people in the world, generally. But this is going to be a trend that you're going to see going forward in the future, that there are going to be more older people than people, people over 65 than under, six, under five years old in the future. We're at an inflection point here. I think it's very interesting to, to think about that. And the reasons why, because we have a very low death rate in the world, globally overall. And we, our birth rates are declining. That's a good and a bad thing if you think about it. Right? And the reason why it's good and bad is that, well, I'm sorry, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and there's, in addition to a lower death rate and a lower birth rate, our life expectancy is going up. That's a great thing, right? Um, where a lot of the kind of like um, diseases of poverty tend to be things that we are very good at, at as a society at curing, right? So right now, what's the, the problems we are facing are, are diseases that are not of poverty but of age. That's an interesting problem to have. Um, that's something that we as human beings have not encountered until recently. All right, and one of the reasons why we have this kind of decrease in death rate and increase in in uh, sorry uh, decrease in uh, like a really low death rate and a really a drop in birth rate is that a lot of countries and a lot of areas in the world are undergoing this kind of demographic transition model. All right. So if you look at from um, undeveloped societies to completely developed societies is kind of the, the general trend. Right. So most undeveloped societies have high birth rates, also have high death rates. Right. Think about ancient history. Think about the diseases that were that that take place. Right. As you undergo economic development, the first thing that happens is that your death rates plummet because you have better sanitation, uh, better increased access to food sources, increased access to health care. Right? So people get wealthier, they can afford those things. Right? So that's the first thing that happens. It's just the, the, the increased um, economic development equals increased access to those things we equal to drop in the birth rate. Uh, sorry, drop in the death rate. Birth rate stays constant for a while. But then at stage three, what ends up happening is that education takes hold. So in general, this is, this is, this is uh, the truth. The more educated a society is, the lower their birth rate is. Because it's not a, we go from a, um, what's called an N model, 
for having as many offspring as possible to, to ensure that at least one of them will be successful to an R model, where we're having fewer offspring, but we're putting more resources into each offspring to ensure their success, right? So if you think about it, like if, you know, if somebody's an educated peasant, an, an, an uneducated peasant farmer back 300 years ago, right? They're gonna have as many children as possible because a lot of them are gonna die of diseases. Um, and, um, and they need the labor. They want, if they're a farmer, they want more field hands. Honestly, children are free labor for them, if you think about it, right? If you think about it that way. And then maybe one or two of them will, you know, will grow up to an old age, get married, inherit the land, et cetera, right? Nowadays, think about where, where you guys are at, right? You probably don't have 20 siblings, or, you know, but you probably have like, you know, two or three siblings, maybe an old child. But your parents have invested the resources so that you can get a good education, you have, you know, clothes in your back, shelter over your head, et cetera. Right? So therefore, the higher education means that more people are following the kind of R model where you're having fewer, fewer children, but you're putting more resources into each child to ensure each child's success. Right? And so that leads to the decline in, in birth rates. And that's why um, it's actually there's a lot of gold mill initiatives out there to increase education in, in third world and developing countries because this will actually uh, lead to kind of the switch. And that's a good thing for a human population because if you have a kind of more stabilized human population, you can, it, it reduces the strain on resources in the world. Right? And then I'll pretty, let me see, most, developing country, most developed countries, most Western countries are at this stage where you basically have birth rates near death rates and you stabilize the population. And in some cases, actually, it's actually, um, a bit of a problem where your death rate is actually higher than your birth rate. So if, like a lot of countries, if you have a birth rate below two, you're below replacement level, right? Like I think it's like 2.1 is the, the required birth rate to like basically replace your population. So a lot of countries are experiencing that as a problem. Russia is doing, uh, Russia has that problem. A lot, of East, a lot of Western Europe has that problem, right? And so they're kind of encountering how do we actually increase birth rates? Because we've driven death rates to as low as we possibly can at least given the current technology, right? So that's an interesting demographic problem. Well, I want you to see this in kind of a different form. So this is kind of, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with these kind of graphs. So I'm taking this from sociology lectures. Um, these are kind of age distribution graphs um, of, uh, over time. So each of these is a kind of five year breakdown. So each of these is a segment of uh, you know, zero to five years old, five to 10, 10 to 15, et cetera. And the population of males and females in the millions during that time. So in 1950, this was the population of Africa in that time, right? Broken down by age, demographic breakdown. Again, so what, if you look at the Africa, Africa 1950, Africa today, around today, and Africa in the future, what stage of economic development do you think they would be at? What do you think? So where were they in 1950, you think? Stage one, right? High, high, high birth rates, high death rates. Very low population, very stable, generally speaking. Right? Where, were they, where are they today? Where do you think they are? They're in stage two, right? So a lot of the just modern technology has really increased, decreased their death rates, right? So that's good. They have access to food. They have access to clean water, generally speaking, obviously more than they used to. But their birth rates aren't declining yet because the education hasn't really kind of set in. That takes a, at least a generation, if not more, to really, to really root in, right? And what you're going to hopefully see, and this is, again, yes, Maddie? Yes. Yes, that is a problem. So yeah, one of the things that Maddie's talking about is that like this, this is like you know kind of like this kind of exponential bell curve now. What they're predicting in the future, if, if Africa follows this mode of economic development, is that they're going to reach stage three and stage four, right? So by stage four, what you're hopefully going to get is this kind of rounding of the bell curve, where you're going to have a stable population. Obviously, like this population up here is going to get reduced because you have death and aging is going to take away a lot of that, right? But hopefully, you're not going to see this exponential growth in the the future generations like you do here, okay? So this is a kind of model of kind of like a, a, a continent, actually, not even a country, a continent that's 
uh, was in stage one in the 1950s, is entering stage two, and hopefully with advances in education, um, will enter stage three and, and maybe reach stage four in the next 50, 100 years. That's crossing your fingers, everything goes right, that kind of stuff, right? Well, what about some other areas? What do you see about here? Okay, this is Europe. What do you see here that's really interesting? Where were they in 1950, you think? All right, so think about where Europe was in the 1950s. Think about your history. All right, they just exited World War II five years ago. So it's kind of pretty obvious there was some major population issues in, the, in people in their 20s and 30s, right? So where do you think they were in about 1950? Between two and three, right? So actually, this is you know post World War II. Their death rates were up really high and dropped pretty, pre pre pretty precipitously after after the war, right? So that's that's a good thing. And so what you saw actually was that there was this generation born after World War II that's basically alive now in their 50s and 60s, right, that have like a, like a basically a, a baby boom. Right? So they were in stage two, stage three in the last 50 years. They've reached that stage four. In fact, they've kind of gone down the other way, right? You see this, right? That's a bad sign if you want a stable population. That's a sign of a declining population. A lot of that is because their birth rates are, again, most, every look, you look at almost every single European country, most of their birth rates are below two. All right, so that means that they cannot replace the population that they currently have. All right, and so what you're, this is again demographic modeling going ahead. What you're going to see is probably a kind of stabiliz stabilization of the population in Europe at a lower level than it currently is in the next hundred years. And then the, and then here, is the U.S. What an interesting case here. Okay, so again we have see this a little bit right here. 1950, this was the start of the first baby boomer generation, right? And this is where we're at right now. So this is the baby boomer generation, right? This is basically us, people in the 2030s. We're basically the children of the baby boom generation, right? And we're in some ways very, uh, very fortunate in that we haven't had that kind of population decline that Europe has had. A lot of that's due to immigration. Immigrants in general tend to have more children than, than non-immigrants. Some of that's education level, some of that's cultural. Um, but it, it does bode well for the system that our population can grow and or stabilize in the next 100 years without that kind of problem of your population contracting. Because that brings with it a lot of societal issues. Like how do you take care of a, a majority elderly population? Um, you actually want more, more of your resources going to you know, educating your young instead of taking care of your, old, your elderly. That's, a, that's the ideal reality sometimes doesn't meet that. Right? Yes? Ever? Yeah, I think so. Like, like you know, 10 to 20 tends to be children, right? 20 to 65 tends to be working age adults, and then anything above 65 tend to be retired, right? So, yeah. Yeah, that's ideally what you'd like to see. That like every person who's retired has more than one person supporting them, right? Europe, Europe has this problem where that's not going to be the case. So if I go back to Europe, right? Um, this is a problem right here. If in the next 50 years there's more elderly than people who can actually support them economically, that, that ec sociologically speaking, economically is a problem. Again, I'm not an economics expert, so I can't tell you the reasons why. But they do, they do have this problem. Japan has this problem too as well. Yes? Some of space. Um, Yes. It's also education issues, though. Like, it's, it's space plus economics plus education. If you're more economically well off, if you think you have more opportunities, you're more likely to want to have children. If you have the space, you have to grow. Economically speaking, the land is cheaper, housing is cheaper, it's not as hard to get housing. That's going to influence whether or not you want to have children. Right? 
Yes, ma. Good, yes. So there's yeah. So you know how people are saying demographically, we're becoming a more uh, uh, mixed nation, right? So um, I think it was an interesting milestone. Was it last year that uh, for the first time ever in U.S. history, the the number of non-Caucasian childbirths outnumbered the number of Caucasian childbirths. So like it's in the in the way that you know um, Caucasians won't be the min majority. We're going to be a minority majority nation by like 2050. Right, that's the demographics speaking. So a lot of that is due to the growth in the Hispanic population, um, some growth in other minority populations, big, the big, biggest part, and also the decline in birth rates of the Caucasian population. That, that is something to do with that. So I, I'm not a political expert, but I'm assuming that has some social economic and political effects that I will not comment into. All right? That is true. Um, but immigrants also you know, provide um, innovation as well. Immigrants are, tend to be about two or three times more likely to get patents. Reasons why I think there's, I don't, not 100% know, I'm not a sociologist. All right, so moving on. Um, so, you know, this demographic trend that's in the United States is following the rest of the world where our life expectancy is going up, right? The average life expectancy, if you were born to today, you could, you're living to about 79, generally. Right, so I was born here. I could expect to live around 75. You guys were probably born about, expect to live around 76, 77. Yes? That's 1917. Guess what happened then? Not World War I, not in the United States. Thank you. Yes, Spanish flu. So, yes, yeah, something like that can cut your life expectancy that for people born that year very quickly because think of what happened that year. So that's an interesting blip on the radar, but thank you for noticing for me. All right, so this is a bit of the demographics. World's getting older. Dem um, not a bad thing if you think about how that is uh, in place as far as, uh, as far as economic progress, right? World's getting older because we're curing easily curable diseases or solving easily solvable health problems. The problem with that is that it brings up a whole new set of health problems. Aging is one of them. Cancer is another one, we'll talk about that, and obesity is that one we talked about already. Okay, so these are the kind of future health problems that you guys as bioengineers are probably going to face and going to be more common in the future. Yes? It's a side effect of societies having more access to food. If you can eat more, you tend to live longer up to a point. But like, you know, this is back to the evolutionary, right? Speaking, we as humans really store fat very well. We're it, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution have programmed us to do that. Unfortunately, we're in an environment where doing that is bad for us because we're, for the first time in human history, we're in an environment where food is common. That's nev like evolutionary speaking, 99.9% .9 of human history. That's not been the case, right? So you have to think about it that way. So that's why it's, a, it's, it's, it's the environment we're in is pro providing these new, new health challenges, obesity, cancer, aging. Again, this is because we've, in the past, I would say, 10,000 years, done a really good job of shaping our history so that's not defined by biology, it's defined by the society and the civilization that we're in. Okay? All right. So this is kind of what you're going to face. These are the problems. The demographics kind of reflect the fact that you're going to see these problems. 